Welcome to Massive Late Fee. And now your hosts, Mark and Carol. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Massive Late Fee. My name is Mark. With me as always is my girlfriend, Carol, how you doing, Carol? Hey, what's up? Not much. It is September 16th, 1994. You sound so confused. I'm yeah, not... Yes, dear. Uh, it, it, it is. I couldn't remember if it was the 16th or the 17th. Or the 15th. Wow. Well, you did know. You, did you do a little too much smoking this weekend, babe? <laughs> you were there. <laughs> so, anyway. It is uh, September 16th, 1994. This is our show. We've got almost no news today, I think. <laughs> let me uh, let me let me tell you real quick here. Uh, I got to grab the paper and I will tell you what what news we have. Carol, why don't you tell us about your your weekend? <laughs> Oh, I think that, um, you know, you just alluded to it. No, we, we had fun. We went to a, a couple parties this weekend. It was it was good. It was celebrating going back to school time. Yeah, so really the only thing that I have, Ken Burns, uh, this dude, is making a documentary about baseball. And it looks like... You know, there, there's some there's some rumblings of of disputing, you know, in baseball with uh, with the players and the owners, and you know, I don't know what's going to happen with the season this this season, but this documentary kind of goes through the entire history of baseball. It's going to be on CBS, I guess. He did, uh, but four years ago, he did a documentary on the Civil War. Which was pretty, uh, pretty impressive, I guess, from what I'm seeing from reviews. But I don't know. It looks this looks somewhat interesting. I might actually check this out. I guess it's how, how does, eighteen and a half hours long. What? First of all, how does that look interesting? It's it's baseball, which is like the most boring sport, and it's the history of baseball. I like baseball. Uh huh. It's boring. It's to some. How is it not boring? I mean, you're just standing there watching a bunch of guys usually I'm swing sitting. bats at balls. How is how is basketball exciting? How is hockey exciting? How's football exciting? There's more running around. There's more movement. There's more action. Okay, so so you have to move in order to be exciting if you're playing a sport. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And anyway, I don't like any of those either. I just like hockey. It's the drama. That's what's exciting about it. The drama wow. of the sport. Okay. If you say so. I don't really see that. But. It's the difference between... So, like, Jack Benny was a famous comedian. And he wasn't like a, uh, like a Milton Berle or a Henny Youngman. Like, Henny Youngman was known for snappy one-liners, right? Okay. So Henny Youngman would would just you know he'd tell these jokes and everything. Milton Berle said, uh, "Did you see my last show at the whatever?" And Kenny Youngman would say, "I hope so." <laughs> you know that that's the kind of my last show. Mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah. So that's the kind of you know take my wife please. He did that. Right. So that's that's the kind of comedian he was. Jack Benny was known for his pauses were funnier than his jokes. Okay. So they call it the pregnant pause where, you know, someone says a line and because everyone knows Jack Benny's persona, Jack Benny's persona, they'd know how he'd react to it. But it's the pause of him thinking that, you know, everybody would laugh at. And when he was on TV, you know, he'd give a look and, and things like that to to sell it. So that's what baseball is. Baseball is the difference between, I guess... Football or basketball would be Henny Youngman and the pleasure of the rapid fire, you know, whatever. And baseball is Jack Benny. It's the pitcher holding the, you know, there's two, there's two outs, two strikes, bottom of the ninth. Pitcher, you know, standing there holding the ball 
everyone's waiting for what's going to happen. That's that's the essence of baseball. Okay. I, I guess. I mean, I'm I'm glad you enjoy it, but the documentary of it sounds terrible. I tell you what, though, if they cancel the World Series over money, uh, I'm going to be real pissed, and I might not come back to baseball. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not cool. So uh, we watched my so-called life. Pretty interesting episode, this episode. Yeah, it was a little bit heavy. Yeah, for sure. So why don't you uh, why don't you explain to the people what happened on my so-called life? <laughs> Please stop saying it that way. That just it's <laughs> it's like bamboo shoots under my fingernails. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um so this one was the fourth episode called Father Figures. Okay. And um makes sense. And it, it focuses on the relationship between both Angela and her father and the mom and her father, Angela's grandfather. Yeah. So, um... What's the mom's name again? Patty. Oh, okay, yeah. Like Patty Do. Patty Do. They make yeah. a reference to that, I think. Right. Um, so in this episode, uh, the dad, find, they find out that they're being audited. Remember, the dad actually works for the mom in the company she took over for her father. Well, I get the, the impression that I get is that the dad started the company and then had some health problems and basically had to retire. Yeah. Like my, my, my impression is that he's basically retired Yes. at this point yeah. and she runs things. Yeah. The dad, I'm sorry. When I said the dad, I meant the dad of the show. I meant her husband. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, her husband works for her. Yes. Yeah. So they're being audited and they're trying to figure out, you know, where all the pieces of the puzzle are because the audit is right at the time that the company was transitioning from Patty's father to her. Yep. And, um, I, I this really bothers me. Okay. The, the, what is the dad's name in the show? We know it's Patty. Patty and what? I don't know. Yeah. So Angela's dad. <laughs> I don't know if they've ever said his name. I'm sure they have. Is it Graham? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Okay. Graham. We're going to say it's Graham. All right. Um, Cracker. So Graham was given tickets to a Grateful Dead concert. Right. By a client or something? Yeah, something. They have a printing company. Yeah. I don't know who is giving. Like, I don't know what clients they're talking about. Right. But. But he's very excited about this because he is a deadhead. Yeah, loves the Grateful Dead. And um, he tells Patty that he has these tickets at the same time as she's telling him about them being audited. Which, this happens throughout the whole episode where they're just both talking about their own issues at the same time and not really paying attention to each other. Yeah, they're never on the same page. And she, so incredibly selfishly in my opinion... Rolls across the table like she's trying to be sexy. Are you trying to manipulate him with your sexy kitten thing? What? And says, are you telling me you're going to top off our audit with a Grateful Dead concert? Please tell me you're not going to do that. What the hell does it matter? As long as he's there for your audit and he wants to go to a concert afterwards, let him go. Yeah, he doesn't say anything during the entire audit. Right. Because he's not in charge of the books. Has never been in charge of the books. Wasn't in charge of the books during this period of time. So he's just there for moral support. Yeah. I mean, it's her and her dad that are being yeah, audited. Correct. So, but I mean, even even if he was part of the audit, again, she's saying top off. So I'm assuming she's thinking the audit will be over, whether it was or not. Who cares? It also seems like it was like a different day. It's so weird. No, it was that day. But it's the, the timeline of this episode is a little weird to me. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you that. So he decides then because Ray Ann. Now the episode kind of starts out with um, they're in the kitchen, mm -hmm. and um, you know he's cooking and Ray Ann's over, and uh, she's all excited when he mentions about having these Grateful Dead tickets because and she's like, oh my mom's going to that, and you know like talking about how great they are, and Angela doesn't really care about the Grateful Dead, right? Because she's a teenager, right? Um, I mean, so is Rayanne, but... Yeah, well, I guess her... I don't know. It's... I guess there are a few kids, or a few people our age that, that like the Grateful Dead, but I mean, the band is, what, like 30 years, or I guess 25 years 
uh, past its prime. Right. So. But, well, I mean, I'm assuming, like, it seems like her and her mom have a really close relationship. Yeah. And so it's probably the influence of her mother who loves them. Yeah, I grant that. So either way, she's so excited for him to be able to go to this. So when his wife says, hey, I don't want you to do it, he decides, I'll give the tickets to the girls and they can go with Rayanne's mom. Right. Now, that seems a little presumptuous to me. Like, Rayanne's mom is going to a concert with a guy. Does she want to take her teenage daughter and her teenage daughter's friend with her? Right. No kidding. And like, I, I don't know. That that seemed odd. But so Rayanne's super excited. And Angela, like, is barely even speaking to or looking at her father at this point because she, you know, last episode heard him on the phone with the lady. Yeah. She she's explained. Was that last episode? I don't I don't know. if It was, it was a last episode or the episode before. But she's i think it was the episode before it might have been yeah but she yeah she had basically throughout the entire thing narration wise mm-hmm. she talks about how she is mad at her dad right. but she doesn't know if she should be she's looking for reasons to reinforce her anger at him but she's mad at him uh presumably because you know he almost cheated on this on his mom with this girl right and I don't know, I mean, like, what she heard sounded pretty damning, but, I mean, she doesn't, I guess she doesn't feel like she knows for sure. Well, what she heard was that he couldn't do it. Yeah. And that, you know, saying no. But she also saw him with her before that, too. Right. So, yeah. Um. So, yeah, she's mad at her dad. She, she has no idea why, which is ridiculous. Yeah, he keeps the whole episode being like, I think something's wrong between me and Angela. What could it be? Hmm. Like, idiot. <laughs> and, um, so Rayanne's excited. Angela's like, yeah, whatever, and kind of blows him off. And, um, then it shows them in, um, in, in school. Rayanne says the next day to Angela, like, you can tell Rayanne's got a little crush on her dad. Oh, yeah. For which, sure. Which I think, you know, probably, you know, she doesn't have a dad, so. Yeah. Um. But she's like, not to shock you, but your dad's attractive. Like, that was not the right thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Angela. Even Ricky thinks he's cute. Yeah. He, say, he mentions his stubble. Yeah. Yeah, the stubble comes up throughout the episode. Like, Rayanne's like, you didn't tell me your dad has stubble. Mm-hmm. And then the little sister likes the stubble. Right. And then between Patty and her dad... He went to give her a kiss at one point, and he's like, oh, I haven't shaved today, and doesn't, because when she was a kid, she didn't like it. Yeah, she didn't like the stubble. Which, that's kind of weird, like, because her husband has stubble. Yeah, I, I, well, I don't know, maybe she's grown out of that, or... I did, is different. Yeah, (laughs) I'm sure there's a metaphor there somewhere. Right. Um, okay, so... The grandpa is, um, I'm sorry, I'm, we're in school. <laughs> They're talking about dad being hot and everything. Angela is, like, sickened by it. And now she's in class and takes the tickets, which she had demanded her father physically give to her. Right. Takes them out of her backpack and is, like, waving them around in front of Jordan. Yeah, I think she's trying to impress him. Right. And he doesn't care about the Grateful Dead because, again, he's a teenager. Right. And um, she's like, hey, I owe you money for that ID, which that worthless ID that says she was born yesterday. Right. And um, owes him $30. Right. So he suggests that she sell the tickets. Correct. So that she can get some money. Right. So it's just, yeah. I mean, and what she ends up getting, we find out, is like $120. Yeah. Um, So 60 bucks for each ticket. Right. It's pretty good, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's great, but that's way more than she needed. Yeah. And she certainly shouldn't have sold those tickets. Should she have just sold a quarter of the tickets? (laughs) I mean, there's not, you you kind of have to sell them like that. She shouldn't have sold the tickets at all. Well, I agree. She should not have. And um, But she didn't want to take a gift from her dad. That's part of it. Yeah. And Rayanne 
um, is so upset with her for selling the tickets. Like, barely talks to her throughout the episode after that. Yeah. And, you know, at the end, like, when they're talking about it, she says, you know, she didn't want... Like, I, did, what it, did Angela tell her why she's upset? She did. Angela tells Rayanne about... No, she tells Ricky. It's Ricky? Yeah. Ricky, okay. She tells Ricky why she's upset. She doesn't tell uh, Ann, or, uh, Rayanne. And Rayanne says that, you know, your dad probably gives you stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. So you don't care. But that meant a lot to me that he would give us those tickets. Right. And you gave them away. And she's like, and he gave them to us, not just you. Yeah. Yeah. She was upset when she first heard about him because she was like, you know, the, he gave those to us. Those were our tickets. Right. Like mine, too. And Angela, if she was going to sell the tickets, certainly shouldn't have sold Ray Ann's, too. Right. I mean, that's the, you know, she's, that's totally overstepping. And I mean, honestly, she owed Rayanne the 60 bucks she got for it, in my opinion, but yeah. I don't think she gave it to her. I doubt it. And I mean, really, she probably should have given the, the, all the money to her dad. Yeah. Or his tickets. Yep. She was just wrong all over the place. Agreed. But in the end, she, she, when she's talking about how she's upset with her dad and stuff, I guess it was Ricky who says, but at the end of the day, you still have the kind of dad who would lay two Grateful Dead tickets on you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, she, you know, she doesn't appreciate her dad, which, I mean, I guess it's hard for me to understand because, like, I, I haven't. My dad died when I was younger, and I, mm-hmm. I don't really get the relationship, I guess. Um, but it seems pretty complex. Oh, yeah. Um, between teenage girls and their dads just in talking to my friends and stuff. It's like, it seemed, it does seem like, like the mom says to the dad at some point in the episode, like she's, you know, pushing you off, off her pedestal, off your pedestal. Mm -hmm. And it really does seem that way. Like, like they do have their dads up on this pedestal. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And then when they come down, they come down hard. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I I was never a girl. Right. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't know how the, the relationship, my relationship with my dad is obviously different right. than, than uh, my sister's relationship with my dad. Uh, I don't think they, they've ever pushed him off of his pedestal. No. I don't think they ever will. Aw, so um, they're just daddy, daddy's girls forever, huh? Yeah. Yeah, basically. We'll see. So, well, I mean, if they were going to, they passed that point at this point. Okay. I mean, my sister is 22. I don't know. Patty pushed her dad off the pedestal in this episode. Yeah. I mean, that's true. Uh, you know, I guess. She was talking about how Angela's doing it on time instead of waiting like right. she did. So. But, yeah, so the dad, the reason they're getting audited is because the dad took an 80% deduction of a car he bought because it was a business car and he keeps interfering in the audit and calling the person directly and clearly you know patty says you know she's trying to trip you up and you know i don't know why you're doing this they have the the meeting at the house instead of at the office at the the agent's suggestion yeah that's because so dumb. you know get you know comfortable area you know, uh-huh. if you're comfortable, then you're more likely to open up. I mean, it's like interrogation 101. And... Well, there's a bunch of they can see what kind of lifestyle they live. Oh, for sure. But, so she starts talking to him, and, and she, you know, like, she's about to leave and everything, and she says, <clears throat> she says about vacations and, and stuff like that and everything, and going to the Bahamas. He's like, oh, I, I was to the Bahamas only once, you know, in the... 1953 or whatever it was. <laughs> and she says, you know, but you take vacations all the time. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, like uh, like driving trips with my wife because, you know, we need to get away. And she's like, oh, what car do you use for that? <laughs> he says, the, the wagon, the car that he's trying to deduct. Right. And, yeah, yeah so he, he messes up. So Patty says, you know, we'll pay the taxes that we owe. Right. Basically. And so you know, to avoid jail. Because, I mean, he did commit a tax fraud. Yeah. That's that's a big deal. Yep. Do you really think they'd put him in jail? 
Mm, I mean, not really. And what they want is the money. That's right. why when she said, do we have, you know, we'll pay the taxes, we owe, do we have a deal? She's like, yeah. Yeah. I wonder how much it was. And I wonder if they just have it lying around. I mean, it seems like they do. Well, it's 80% of a car. So right. whatever that is, probably, I don't know, in the neighborhood of like eight grand or something yeah. like that, I'm guessing. That's an awful lot of money to just give up. Yeah. Well, yeah, I agree. But it wasn't theirs to begin with. So. Right. He got extra off his taxes that he should not have. Right. Uh, so, yeah, that was the episode of life. No, uh, my so-called life. <laughs> my so-called life. Uh, but, yeah, so we watched a film this week, as is tradition. This week we watched quiz show quite an interesting film i think carol what did you think now so i know a little bit about this this subject i'm interested what did you think of of quiz show um i i enjoyed the film quite a bit um it was i it was i mean it was good it wasn't like my favorite movie or whatever but yeah, it was a decent movie. What did what do you think? Wow, what a scintillating review that was. I'm sorry. It was decent. It wasn't like my favorite movie or whatever. <laughs> okay. So that that's what you have to say about Quiz Show, huh? Well, no. I mean, obviously I have more. I was just giving you the overview. My general opinion. It's very general. Um, so, <laughs> the the movie, in case you're unaware concerns itself with the quiz show scandals of the 1950s. This is when it was discovered that the American public had been lied to, ostensibly, by uh, producers of these quiz shows. Uh, NBC is featured in this. Uh, some of the shows were on, were on other networks uh, as well. Uh, Geritol, the, <laughs> the old, I don't even know, a tonic, I guess. What you know is is featured also heavily in in this movie, and basically what happened was is that contestants were given the answers uh, to the questions and and what the questions would be prior to taping, and basically what they wanted to do is so from what I've read about this when they first did Twenty One that was the signature show that's the one the big one behind the scandal. And that was the big, you know, the big uh, show at the at the time, the the most popular one. It's like the scoring is basically loose on, or is loosely based on blackjack, so you know, up to twenty one, right. you know, you win, and you can take. I, I believe it's for anywhere from one to eleven points, and the the higher point point total, the more complicated the question, the harder the question is. And that's the the basics of how the game was played. When they first broadcast it in real life, uh, when they first uh, did, you know, the pilot for this show, it was a dismal failure. The question, their contestants were getting quest- like a bunch of questions wrong. It just didn't flow at all. It was terrible. Hmm. And Dan Enright, who was the producer of the show, vowed that this was never going to happen again. And decided at that point to script it, basically, to give contestants the answers to create heroes, to create villains, to create drama, you know, and everything uh, for the show. And it was from that point on, it was even even after they did that, the first season or so got really bad reviews. Not a lot of people liked it. And he as he continued to to kind of modify uh, what, how he packaged everything, and they go into a lot of the detail of that in uh, in very small areas in this movie, like how uh, Herbert Stemple is talking about how you know pats the brow, don't smear the brow when uh, you're wiping perspiration away, and I mean and that seems stuff. like just general advice. I mean, but I think that's part of the. I think that's all part of the drama, you know. And he, like he said, you know, pause. Close your eyes, then open your eyes, give a dazzling smile, and it's 
like all that stuff. It's all scripted to this is how you present yourself. He wanted to the contestants to present themselves in a certain way. Right. So the the movie starts out with uh, Sputnik, I guess, just to give us perspective of where we're at yeah. in in the country, what what year we're at, what what's going on. So Russia has just launched the first satellite into orbit, beating America to the space race. They're the first to have somebody, you know, to have an object orbiting Earth, right. listening to us, as they say. I mean, very scary times for sure. And we're introduced to uh, Robert Goodwin, who is the protagonist, played by uh, Joel Fleischman from yeah. Northern Exposure. It's nice to see to see him. Uh, Rob Morrow is his name. It's uh, nice to see him play someone that that's not uh, Doctor Fleischman. Yeah, he does a really good job. He does. He's very good in this movie. As is Ray, Ray Fiennes, who plays what's his name, Charles Van Doren. Yeah. Uh, nice to see him play someone that's not a sadistic Nazi, <laughs> like he did in uh, in Schindler's List. So, basically, uh, Robert Goodwin works for, I think it's, I can't remember what, he works for Congress. He works, he's like, he works under one of the secretaries, one of the cabinet secretaries in the White House. But I can't remember which one. I know he says we have... We ha- we have oversight over all the agencies, including the FCC, at one point. But I can't remember what group he works for. Wow. Or what committee. I think maybe he works for a congressman who works for a committee, and the congressman is the chairman of this committee or something. Maybe it's like the House Oversight Committee or something. So it's like they have oversight over all. Yeah, that's probably what it is. So he's probably the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, the, his boss. The, the senator, uh-huh. or I mean the uh, the congressman, and he works for him with those other guys that they were, you know, and and that's what they do is they they you know exercise oversight over different government areas and they conduct investigations for him and and all that stuff. He's a lawyer, um, you know, that's his that's his profession. So he's you know he's the, the main character in the in the movie i would say him and and charles van doren kind of share kind of share main character duties and then it's funny too his his wife in real life because these people are all real obviously but his wife in real life is you're looking at me like you're gonna fall asleep over there you're just like you're what (laughs) it's just crazy what you're doing what are you talking about just your face well no because okay because you the look on my face is is conveying the fact that i am just amazed that you know like all of these details and like all of this stuff and it's like did we watch the same movie did you know some of this before because i didn't even know about the game show like or quiz show or whatever problems from the 50s this is like all new to me and like you just get all the details from watching stuff and it's like i just feel like an inferior intellect because i sat there through the same movie and walked out going huh cool movie about the quiz shows and you're like you know government people and conspiracies and how everybody's related to everything and i'm just like what i don't know so that's the look i'm not falling asleep i'm in, i'm i'm in awe oh, okay well i guess that's I- I don't know if my head can fit in this room anymore, but, um, but anyway, so his wife, well, I, the, the thing I was going to say is his wife, Robert Goodwin's wife, uh, played by Uma, or not, uh, no, you, you said Uma Thurman earlier too. And I was like, she was not in this movie. Yeah. What is her name? I don't know, but she's very pretty. <laughs> um, I know it too. I can't think of her name off the top of my That's head. That's okay. The listeners We'll know. But anyway, so Mira Sorvino. Okay. I think. Sure. Anyway, so she's in this movie. She she plays uh, his wife, uh, a fairly formidable woman <laughs> at times. <laughs> yes. Uh, her name in real life, because like I said, these are all based on real life people, is Doris Kearns Goodwin, and she is a historian. Okay. She, she's written... Several very interesting books about different presidents. She's worked with different presidents, at, you know, at, at a 
capacity of kind of biography, biographying them and, and everything. Like I said, she's a, a noted historian. So it's, uh, it's interesting to, to see her. She's, you know, cause I know her outside of this movie. Mm-hmm. Cause I've read some of her books and it's funny to see her in here and it's not, that's my boyfriend, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I like history a lot. So anyway, basically, uh, then we switch to Charles Van Doren, played by Ray Fiennes, who who is uh, a member of one of the most prominent intellectual families in the country. So his father Mark and his uncle, I think, I think also Charles. Yeah, it, you know, won the Pulitzer Prize. They both won the Pulitzer Prize, and they, you know, they're they're big time. You know, his his dad is a a long-standing professor at Columbia University. And a poet, right? Yeah, and a poet, yes. And uh, I assume that's what he won the Pulitzer Prize for. I wonder if they had an inside track, because Columbia (laughs) is the university that issues the Pulitzer Prize. Oh, wow. (laughs) So they gave it to one of their own Yeah, (laughs) at some point. But anyway, so he, uh, he is fascinated by these quiz shows. And throughout the, throughout the movie, there are people watching these shows and saying the answers to the screen. Mm-hmm. Like we do, like everyone does when you watch these quiz shows. Yeah. But some of these questions are pretty hard. And I don't know if it's supposed to convey that, for instance, like Rob Morrow's character, Robert Goodwin, is really smart. Or if it's supposed to convey that, that more that in general, people knew more of these answers. That I guess maybe just in general, people were smarter back in the 50s or more worldly. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true, but I don't know if that's what the movie's trying to tell us is true. Well, why? What would be the point of that? I don't... I don't, I don't know. I, I, but that's I, what I'm saying. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if they're trying to convey that certain people that are watching are intelligent or, or if everyone was, I don't know what they're trying to convey here. Hmm. I think they were just trying to convey that people watch the show and, and treat it like we watch shows now and say the answers to the screen. I mean, I guess. Certainly in the Marty scene, that's definitely the case. <laughs> right. But, yeah, I don't know. Like when they're talking about Paul Revere's horse and, and all that stuff. I mean, I knew some of that stuff. I didn't know. I didn't know all of it though. Who would? It's so crazy. Was I mean, Paul I guess Revere's the historian or... wife would maybe know. Maybe know the name of a famous person's horse. Right. What was his? What was the horse's name? Who loaned him the horse? What was the horse? A, ma- a mare or a uh, or a stallion? All that stuff. Yeah, there's no way. He asked. The, the, the first two questions seemed easy enough, though. How many lanterns were in the Old North Church? I have no idea. Well, it was one if by land, two if by sea. Okay. And that came by boat. And and we just so watched two. this movie, and I should know the answer, mm-hmm. but that's how fast things come and go from my brain. And then the, other, the next question was, who rode with him? No clue. Dawes and Prescott. Yeah. So yeah, it's like a name I've never heard before. No, no. Dawes is one person. Prescott's another person. Oh, okay. Those are their last names. Okay. But those are things that, you know, you could know. Whether or not, I mean, you, the the obscurity of whether or not the horse was a, a mare or a stallion and what its name was is insane. I mean, you got a 50-50 shot with whether or not it's a mare or a stallion. But right. the name? No. Yeah. Snickers. <laughs> I don't know what the name was. I don't think they actually said it uh, in the movie, and I, I haven't bothered to go to the library and look it up. But either way, so that you know, he, Charles Van Doren's watching this. He's fascinated by it and everything. And they, you know, what's interesting about the movie is they never really give his motivation for wanting to go on this, wanting to go on the show. He he decides to you know sign up for a quiz show because he says when he's doing his interview thing that people say he's, you know, he's got kind of a knack for it. He's got a mind for it Mm -hmm. and everything, but we never really learn his motivation. Well, I mean, he's a professor. He comes from a intellectual family. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, yeah, okay, we don't know his motivation, but I, I would assume that it was just something that seems fun to him. Maybe he's trying to show off to his family, you know, stand yeah. out. I think what it is, and we get a little bit of an allusion to it, I think what it is, you know, towards the end we, we get this a little bit, is that he wanted something that was just his. Okay. I think he felt in the shadow of his uncle, his very famous uncle, and his father. And he mentions that a couple of times. Yeah. You know, like he says, oh, I never see you in the office anymore, Charlie. And he says, oh, I'm there. It's just that, you know, I can't, uh, you can't see me behind your reputation or something. Right. Like and, you know, it's all very playful and joking and everything. But I really do feel, think he felt constrained yeah. by his, his father and his uncle. And I think he wanted to do something that was just his. Because at the end, he, say, he says something like that. He says that, you know, he had achieved something with his name or whatever. And his dad says, your name is my name. Yep. And, you know, so it's, yeah, it's... But anyway, so he decides to go on to the show. Herbert Stemple is played by... Nah, not that one. Um, I was confused to I was confused Stanley Tucci with this guy, but it's not Stanley Tucci. It's the other guy. I have no idea. You know I'm terrible with names. Oh, what is his name? I like him a lot too. He's a very good actor. But anyway, I'll think of his name in a minute. So he plays Herbert Stemple, who is the outgoing champion, although he doesn't know it yet. Right. At the beginning He's talking about Geritol, how great Geritol is, and, and all this stuff, and, and everything. And the uh, the Geritol guy, played by, it's so funny, played by Martin Scorsese, the director. He, um, he calls up NBC and says, the chairman of, of NBC, and says that he wants him gone. He's like, I don't want him on here anymore. I, I hate him. I don't like the guy. He's ugly. Get him off. So weird. Then the chairman of, of NBC is like, you know, well, he's got an everyman quality. We like him, all this stuff. But basically, he calls the uh, John Turturro. That's the guy's name. John Turturro. But anyway, so he calls. So that's Herbert Stemple. He calls the producer and says, played by the guy from City Slickers. Yeah. So, and he says to him, uh, you know, basically you got to ax him, you know, because the sponsors don't like him anymore. And they've threatened to pull sponsorship from the show. And that, you know, back then, I mean, a lot, a lot now, too. But back then, sponsors, the sponsors were everything. So he's going to get kicked off, basically. And they, he doesn't know it yet. But they're going to kick him off the show, Howard Stemple. Yeah. So they need to find somebody else. So Charles Van Doren comes in, does his his little interview and everything, and they ask him a question about Ulysses S. Grant getting uh, jailed for a brief period of time during the Civil War, and they wanted to know who the commanding general was, and he says Halleck, George W. Halleck. And... You know, he's right. So, they, you know, he, the guy, I think Hank Azaria is his, the assistant, right? And he's like, I got the guy, I got the guy, you know, and everything. <laughs> he's like, yeah, it's Van Doren, you know. Yeah, because he looks like a Ken doll. He does. He's very handsome, very charming, and he's from a very prominent family. So, they call him in. They do an interview with him. They say, hey, you know, we want you on 21. He was trying to go on Tic Tac Doe. <laughs> but so they say we want you on 21 you know it's the big the big time right and they need him to be in on the fix they right. need to ensure he's going to get 21 so that stemple can lose right so they try to say to him hey you know what if we gave you the answers basically and at first, he doesn't want to do it. He's like, oh, you know, it seems dishonest. I wouldn't want to do it, you know, and everything. And, you know, he's like, oh, is this a test? 
and they kind of <laughs> laugh and everything. And they say, yeah, you know, okay, so, you know, you're going to do it honestly and everything. They go to Stemple, and they say, you got to take a dive. He wants to be famous. He loves the attention. Uh-huh. Loves it. So he wants to go down a panel show. Uh, I don't. Do you know what a panel show is? Yeah. Okay. I yeah, was where people like there's a d- group of people discussing topics, right? Uh, I mean, never. Okay. Well, then tell me what a panel show is. So, what I what I believe they're referring to is like what's my line, or I've got a secret, where there's a panel of of people. Uh-huh. So, like, on What's My Line, it was almost always Bennett Cerf, uh, well, what's her name, Dorothy Kilgallen, and, oh, I can't think of her name. And then they'd have a rotating guest come in. Mm-hmm. And it would be you know, be somebody different each, each time. Arlene Francis, that's what I'm thinking of. Bennett Cerf, Arlene Francis, and Dorothy Kilgallen. And then they'd have a rotating celebrity come in. So that was what's my line. I, I think uh, and I've got a secret. I just remember one. And it was Bet- Betty, Betsy Palmer. Betsy Palmer. She played. She, she was on I've Got a Secret. And she played Jason Voorhees' mom in, oh, the, original, okay. in the original the Friday the 13th. She needed a car. Her car broke down. And they offered... Because she, she was, you know, somewhat famous from the past. Uh-huh. But she was semi-retired. And this was something that would be considered kind of like below her, you know? Right. And <clears throat> her car broke down and she needed a, a car. And so she needed the money. Right. And she was like, okay, I'll do it. And that's how, that's how she took the job in Fr- for Friday the 13th. But anyway... So I think that's what they mean when they say panel show. Okay. I think he wanted to be like one of the rotating guests on a show or maybe one of the permanent members on one of these panel shows. I believe. That seems more in line of for the era. Right. But anyway, so he wants to be on that. Now, they make a mistake. I mean, they make several mistakes. They, they do, yes. But one of the mistakes they make is just blowing him off. Just thinking, oh, he'll just go away. Oh, yeah. You know, he... They, he won $70,000 on this show, and he does not go away. He's pissed off at, at at Charles Van Doren. He's pissed off at the whole situation, and he wants justice. He storms into the office. I mean, he he does a bunch of stuff. He oh, ends yeah. up testifying and, and everything, uh, and this is, what, this is what Robert Goodwin sees. And he comes into the office, and he's like, I need the money. And the guy's like, what do you mean? You know, we won $70,000. $70,000 in 1958. Right, that's a ton of money. And he goes, it's tied up in investments. You know, it's like, and he's like, he's like, uh, there's, you know, whatever. And he goes, okay, so can't you talk to your broker? And he's like, it's not really a broker. It's more of a a bookie. (laughs) And he's uh, setting up in Florida right now. And he's like, you gave your money to a bookie who skipped town? Yeah, he's an idiot. Yeah. So, anyway, the, he's pissed off, and he kind of starts this whole thing going. Robert Goodwin sees it, and he, I, for whatever reason, he's captured by it. You know, he says, I think there's something here. We're going to put television on trial. That's his big idea, mm-hmm. is to put TV on trial. Idiot. And <laughs> God love him, but he's an idiot. Right. Well, he's, a, he's one of those, he's one of those... Like optimistic, like Pollyanna-ish yeah. type type people, where he just thinks that, oh, you know, it's it's what's right, you know, and everything like everything's gonna work out. Not realizing that TV, even at this point, at this early stage of it, has people hooked, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's not going anywhere. No. So, anyway, so he starts investigating, and you know, the whole time Charles Van Doren's, you know, doing his thing. Winning a bunch of money, everyone loves him. He's furthering the cause of education in the in the in the country. He's going on the Today Show with Dave Garraway and that chimp that they yeah. had on the Today Show in the fifties, which is stupid as hell. And so 
So he's won $122,000. Right. At least at the last point, I remember them saying how much he'd won. Right. And gotten a job out yeah. of it because, I mean, didn't they hire him to be on the Today Show as the no, co-host? No, not yet. Because he was on there for, like, a lot, it seemed like. Yeah, but he's not on the Today Show yet. Oh. You're jumping the gun. But you just said. I just said what? You just said about the monkey. He guessed, he guessed it. They interviewed him. Okay. So, um, I mean, we, we establish, we establish uh, Dave Garraway and, and the Today Show uh, early in, in, the, in the movie when he's interviewing him, but he's not on the show yet. Okay. So, yeah, he's winning a bunch of money. Rob Morrow starts investigating, and he's investigating him, too, obviously. He's the current champion on the right. show. So he, he starts talking to, to him, and they kind of become friends. They, they develop this sort of friendliness uh, amongst the two of them, even though he's doing all this investigating. But they have a kind of respect for each other, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so during this whole thing, he's going around and looking for other people, too, and most of the people aren't talking to him. They've been instructed not to talk, you know, all this stuff and everything. And then finally, he's going through the the old the old tapes, reel to reel tapes, like like eight millimeter or something. And he sees this guy that answered a question right when he should have answered it wrong, or they expected him to answer it wrong. Like he did not follow their their thing or whatever, right? And so Jack Barry, the, who's the host, is reading the question, and the answer is Emily Dickinson, and he says, uh, so he answers Emily Dickinson, and he goes, oh, I'm sorry. And then he stops and looks, he said, did you say Emily Dickinson? And he kind of nods, and he goes, well, yeah, that's right. You know, And, and it's very clear that mm-hmm. he did not expect that to happen, that he was w- ready to go on with his line and then got flustered. And so... Rob Morrow seeks him out, and this guy apparently sent him himself the answers to the questions on one of those episodes that he was going to appear on two days before he appeared on the episode. Yeah. Even though the question, and by registered mail, even though the questions are supposed to be in a vault and and all this stuff. And uh, so Rob Morrow's got the evidence he needs. He goes and, uh, you know, says, he goes up to the producer and says, look, you know, I know that NBC and Geritol made all this money on it. They're the ones behind it, not you. Turn on them. Let's go. You know, he shows, he's like, oh, you got no evidence. He shows him the registered letter. <laughs> he's like, that's one of the funniest moments. He's like, why would he do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like, oh, damn it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, so he goes, hey, I just had an idea. Um, how would you like to be your own panel show? <laughs> <laughs> and he turns it down yeah. and, um, and says, uh, you know, that they will see him in court basically. So what ends up happening is, uh, you know, they don't, he, they don't turn on NBC or Geritol. He lets them throw him under the bus because he knows that if he turns against them, he will be blackballed from television for the rest of his life. But if he takes the fall, he'll go under for a while and then he'll come back, which is exactly what happened to him. Yeah. You know, they brought the Joker's Wild to TV, him and Jack Perry, uh, you know, in the 70s, I think. So, I mean, it was a while. They were gone for you know, like 10, 10 or 15 years. But, you know, they, you know, they, they were hugely successful at that. So, you know, they, they ended up getting away with it basically and uh, speaking of getting away with it charles van doren has a chance to get away with it uh all he has to do is not say anything because rob morrow's like look i i you know you're not the villain i don't want to put you on trial i want to put television on trial and i'm not going to call you just keep keep low don't say anything so he you know he does make a statement though the the chairman of nbc kind of goads him into making a statement and he he does and says that he's innocent and all this stuff. And Rob Morrow, you know, get, ha, serves him a subpoena. And they have a very interesting conversation where he says that, you know, you, 
I thought to myself, why would you do this? Because you know, you know I'm going to come after you. And he's like, but then it occurred to me, you know I'm going to come after you. And he tells this story about his uncle who cheated on his wife and like years before and told her, you know, after years, after the affair had been over. And he said, Rob Morrow's character said, he was like, I don't understand why you did that. You got away with it. Why did you confess? And he said it was the getting away with it that I couldn't stand. Right. And it, that made, you know, it makes sense. Um, so, you know, he's, he's like, he's equating that to Charles Foster Kane or not Charles Foster, uh, Charles Van Doren. So he says, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't get away with it. Basically. He, it was too much guilt. Is it was the, uh, the problem. So he, he testifies before Congress and basically says, yeah, I did it. Mm-hmm. And all the congressmen go one by one and say how proud they are of him. <laughs> <laughs> and how eloquent he, he was. Because he's just so damn charming. Until they get to the New Yorker who goes, yeah, I'm from New York. Uh, forget about it. <laughs> he says, uh, he says, I don't think an adult of your intelligence should be commended for telling the truth right. at some point. Uh, and so I'm not going to commend you uh, and, and everything. And then everyone kind of cheers. And it's pretty clear that public opinion is going to be against him at yeah. this point. And he, he's he been fired from the Today Show and been uh, he's going to be fired from Columbia. That seems really unfair to fire him from his job as a professor. He lied. But it was television. Yeah, well, I know. I understand what you're saying. Oh, and to get you your point about the Today Show. So what happened was, is he wasn't supposed to lose. He was supposed to keep winning, right? but he was done. And he threw the game at the end, his last game, when he was going against Mrs. Nearing. Mm-hmm. And so they, 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 hurried, um, they hurried Garraway up there and, uh, and offered him a job, $50,000 a year, to be a correspondent on the Today Show, like right there, because they wanted him in the yeah. fold. You know, and everything. So that was a good. That was a good scene. Yeah, the other good scene was between him and his dad, mm-hmm. uh, who I can't remember the, the name of the actor that plays his dad, but also very, very good actor. Very strong performances between uh, both of them. Just a really well acted movie all the way around. But I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, it's one of my favorites of the year. Yeah, for sure. That was a very good movie. Well, that is our episode for the week. We will end this episode as we end every episode with our blockbuster pick of the week. Carol, what is your blockbuster pick of the week? Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with... Uh... No, it's funny because <laughs> because I, I haven't shown her the... I the was, pamphlet from Blockbuster. I was just so going to come up with one, but okay. Oh, you think you know what's out, what's coming out? No, I was just going to go with one I know is already out, like an older movie. Like what? Like The Chase? Uh, Flatliners. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is, uh, that, that's definitely an older film. Uh, no, but coming this week, so some that we've talked about already. Uh, one is The Crow. So, eh, I don't know. I listen to Cheryl Crow. Don't watch The Crow. <laughs> right? <laughs> Reality Bites. That was a really good. That's one of my favorite movies that we've covered. Yeah, Reality Bites. Very, very good film. That's probably, I mean, go back and listen to that tape, but then also go and go and rent Reality Bites. Yeah, rent Reality Bites, then what listen movie. to the tape. Absolutely. Well, yes. Yeah, that's the order you should do it. <laughs> that's correct. But that is our episode for the week. Carol, take us home. Um, okay, so, you know, like, tell people about us and listen to us and give us stars and, and subscribe and, and money and all the things. All right, have a good day. Bye. Bye.